name is Sarah O'Malley, and this is my colleague, Larissa Harari. Uh, thank you to Professor Hollowell and Professor Darity for uh, letting us speak today. We're excited to be here. <clears throat> so as we move into our presentation, it might seem odd to shift from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Brazil, but as Larissa and I reflected on the Tulsa Race Massacre, and its violence, inequity, and inequality in connection to our own day-to-day -day work and life experience. Myself, as a global health student researching malaria and One Health in the Peruvian Amazon, who has studied both Spanish and Portuguese, and Larissa, as an international development and policy student from Brazil, focused on social policies and inequalities reduction through civil society engagement. We began to draw parallels between the two contexts in racially charged violence as perpetrated by the state, by agents of the state, and by the inaction of the state. As we began to understand violence in Brazil, it became clear to us it is appearing on two fronts in what we label a multiplicity of violence. On an urban front in the security of favelas, slums, born from a long history of slavery. On the rural Amazonian front, it is within developing areas built on historical colonialism. Aware of this history, as we delved into how this dichotomy reflects modern day violence, we decided the best approach to our research was at a, as a literature review. And though still in progress, we have pulled from a combination of academic works, reports, and nudist articles, combi compiling them with our own sentiments. Thank you, Sarah. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to start talking about security and police violence. So in Brazilian cities, uh, especially Rio de Janeiro, uh, are divided, as described by Zuenir Ventura in 1994. On one hand, there is a white middle income class living in the asphalt, horizontal and central areas of the city. On the other hand, there is the mojos, the hills in which slums are informally built. Uh, and are populated by the poor, mostly black, uh, and immigrant population deprived from essential public services. While the degree of lacking in terms of infrastructure, violence, and income uh, varies between the slums and have improved over time, slums have their common origin of when freed African slaves and their descendants were expelled from center shacks to the peripheries during a period of rapid urbanization. So Rio de Janeiro could civilize and modernize itself by expelling second-class citizens to the mojos. So as in many countries, the police has a central mission of protecting the safety of the population and preserving public order. But the police behave under two different sets of rules in Brazil, one in the middle upper income class um, neighborhoods and one in poor communities. In Brazilian slums, whose population is vast majority poor and black, the military police takes the role not of protecting citizens, but instead of fighting crime. Slum territories are treated as dangerous places, and slum dwellers are considered involved directly or indirectly with drug trafficking and crime. With the argument of fighting crime, and in the name of security and order, police behavior towards slum become a significant agent of lethal violence, where lynching, th shooting first and then asking, extrajudicial killings, corruptions, and raids impact the psychological and physical life of all citizens living in that space. The Brazilian police is the most lethal in the world. Uh, in 2014, 15.6% of total homicides in the country were by a police officer. As isolations came into place uh, last year, April, with the COVID-19 pandemic, while robberies and other crimes dropped, police violence surged. Last year in Rio, police cl killed close to six people a day, 43% increase from the same period in 2019. Uh, in April, they were responsible for 35% of all killings. Among the victims of uh, police violence between 2010 and 2013, 99% uh, were male, almost 80% of the victims were black, and three out of four were between the ages of 15 and 29. The brutality of police officers in the name of security became a characteristic of Brazilian ur urban centers since the state's foundation. But pro-order political groups, generally represented by right-wing politicians, 
avoided actions to control police violence, and instead encouraged public safety measures that use force. In 2019, the Rio de Janeiro then, then government said that poli police should shoot uh, the criminals in their little heads, quote, and was applauded by many who believed that good criminal is dead criminal. In the slums, viol violent death has become prolific and accepted, and killings of poor young black men has been perceived with sentiments of de deservedness, uh, understood to be associated with violence. Uh, the general population, including possible victims, see the police as legitimate in using force. To enter the favelas, military police often resort to raids that turn violent, where bystanders become victims and innocents are shot inside their homes. Uh, the using of resisting arrest followed by death argument justify killings and perpetrators remain unpunished. Covering up of crime scenes such as planting guns in the hand of the victim is a common, is common as well as the removal of bodies alleging an attempt to rescue them, uh, to take them to the hospital. Uh, helicopters have been used as using fire plat as fly fire pla firing platforms with a spike in 2017. Uh, this quote, uh, how many more will have to die to, so this war could end, is from a former uh, congresswoman, uh, Marielle Franco, who was shot uh, in 2018. 2019, sorry. Sorry. Uh, one, one. <laughs> so just as a conclusion for this uh, security and police part, uh, the responsibility for police misconduct must lie in the government entities that reinforce the view that crime requires a war rhetoric, while in the urban peripheries uh, suffer, suffer from inaction of the state in terms of provision of basic services such as health, sanitation, education, and infrastructure. It is ostensibly victim of the state in terms of police lethal violence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving to Brazil's rural front, we find violence on the development frontier of the Amazon rainforest, a place historically characterized by indigenous genocide. Development in the Amazon is a facet of globalization in Brazil, this has largely manifested as resource acquisition, namely deforestation for the sake of agriculture and mining. Widespread colonization of the rainforest began in the 1960s with the completion of the Brazilian capital Brasilia, the establish of a establishment of a highway system and a newly implemented militant government. This has continued at various levels of government involvement since then, often under the guise of social improvement, with some control established following the 1988 democracy and subsequent decentralization policy. This relatively modern colonization is inherently similar to historical patterns of colonization across the world and even in Brazil itself in which violence is justified and indigenous people are dehumanized and animalized. Violence has followed this development. In the 1980s, Brazilian violence was nearly entirely concentrated in urban areas, but since 2000 has consistently diffused towards the Amazon. This presents as slave labor, illegal logging, land grabbing, and extermination of indigenous peoples. A paper out of the National School of Public Health in Rio perfectly describes this development violence as the predatory use of natural resources in which indigenous groups, traditional populations, and small-scale farmers are inevitably assaulted. Lost my spot. <laughs> Um, representing a widespread of traditional indigenous territory. Over 700,000 square kilometers of forest have been destroyed since 1979. And it is from these indigenous groups in which the greatest resistance is born in what we'll call environmental defenders. They represent anti-development activism and everything from political engagement to cutting down trees and roads to prevent construction. However, it is often these indigenous defenders who face the greatest violence in a space where lack of government regulation has left much unreported, there are over 2,500 reported cases of violence against defenders, including death threat, 
assault, sexual violence, and homicide. The yearly homicide rate has increased from 66 to 88 individuals per year from 2015 to 2018 alone. And these deaths have included leaders of the landless peasant movement, leaders of the movement of people affected by dams, indigenous leaders, indigenous people, and small-scale workers. This violence is executed by military and civil police officers, as well as unnamed actors who are theoretically tied to economic industry. This movement against indigenous people is perpetrated by the modern regime of Brazil's current president, Jair Bolsonaro. He's explicitly anti-indigenous as well as anti-environment, and his relationship to indigenous groups has been characterized by racist commentary and denial of territorial rights. His policies are increasing deforestation at an exponential rate, creating space for large-scale economic activity at the expense of local peoples. He has continued Michel Temer's policies of gen genocide, mitigating protection of indigenous groups, and offering little to no regulation of illegal activity into indigenous territory. This cycle of development violence is underlyingly characterized by what, by what Rob Nixon has labeled as slow violence in the wake of climate change, pollution, and deforestation, already very vulnerable indigenous ways of life are faced with health, cultural, and resource crises. The inequity of this can even be seen in light of COVID-19, where the infection rate in the Amazon was 150% higher, and the indigenous death rate was 247% higher than the rest of Brazil. Thus, per both the action and inaction of state regulation, the Amazon exists as a space of violence in which small-scale workers and most oppressively indigenous people exist under constant threat. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, we hope that this research, uh, while still in progress, contributes to the discussion that reflects on the multiplicity of violence perpetrated by the state as racially and ethnically driven. Uh, environmental violence, slow violence, and urban police lethality, while di divergent in many ways, require additional exploration. From the research we have conducted until now, we found that they have in common the action and inaction of the state with the objective of maintaining status quo and the prevalence of power over Brazilian society. Our plan is to directly compare the two types of violence, environmental and lethal, to see similarities and difference between them and draw attention to the moral obligations of the state in reducing its violence. Such as in Tulsa, our final reflection is how can we make up for these atrocities, reparate the victims, and stop events like this to happen. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I think for sure the right wing um, politicians being in power simulated violence uh, in terms of um, justifying violence for for security. This this argument of shooting people in the head because they are uh, criminals, um, but also during the pandemic, as many people were at their homes and police raids continue, this increased. Um, police lethality in, lethality in the slums, as many people were there and not going to school, not going to work, so hurting many, many victims. And actually, the Supreme Court of Brazil issued a rule that prohibited raids, raids uh, unless it was essential. Uh, but last year, there was a, a big raid that uh, it was the biggest in the last 20 years that killed more than 40 people. So even with the Supreme Court rule, the police still um, go into this um, slums invasions that we call. Thank you. Yeah, is there a significant difference between the rhetoric that state actors use when discussing the threat posed by rural activists versus urban activists? What I mean is, is that there's a, uh, there's a strong 
strong, there's a strong desire and an understanding amongst, uh, this, especially the three of the middle class, that the people who live in the favelas and, and who are associated with the drug trade are prison threat to them. Is there a similar discourse about rural activists and land activists in the interim? I think there's almost, I would say there's a lack of rhetoric surrounding indigenous people and environmental activists. Um, from what I've read, a lot of it is directed into these kind of indescript death threats. Um, a lot of, I, there's some, there's more military and police violence now with Bolsonaro, but most of it is coming kind of from people who are unlabeled and unnamed. Um, so, the, I mean, there's just not as much discussion about it from what I've seen. Great. Thank you, both. She has a question. There's a question. Oh, one more. Um, it's very fast. It's very fast. Okay, great. <laughs> we'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you both. I'm I'm sorry to be the uh, the timekeeper who forces us to keep moving. Um, our next presentation is from Ashil Javeri, uh, Trinity senior studying political science and computer science. So we'll welcome up Ashil. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Larissa and Sarah, for just giving me a really tough act to follow. Um, and I'm honored to be able to present some of my work um, this past semester. So thanks, Professor Hollowell and, and, and Darity, for you know allowing me for that opportunity. Um, my research project this semester focused on how the qualified immunity defense is being applied at the federal district uh, or trial court level um, recently, so over the past uh, three years. Um, so let's start with what qualified immunity is in the first place. You might have seen this term kind of popping up on the news and specifically noting, noticing some uh, negative coverage. You know, that's the Cato Institute there calling it a legal, practical, and moral failure. Um, here are some op-eds, just uh, first three results on Google. Um, oh, look, even the FBI agrees uh, that it's flawed. Um, and so what is it? Um, it shields uh, government officials uh, from liability in their uh, personal uh, capacity, in their individual capacity, for constitutional violations seeking money damages as long as the official did not violate clearly established law. Um, and so quali qualified immunity is often invoked as a defense by government officials when they get sued, for example, uh, when police officers get sued for excessive use of force or city employees get sued for wrongful termination or something like that. Um, and it's important to note that this defense, uh, again, only insulates uh, officials in their individual capacity, so they can still be sued in their official capacity, um, although there are still uh, a few immunities in that area. Um, the origins of uh, QI, as I'll call it, stretch back to Reconstruction, actually, um, when Section 1983 was passed so that individuals could hold local officials accountable uh, in their complicity of the KKK terror attacks across the South and the country. And it's kind of a really stark dichotomy uh, to kind of the, the way it's being used today. Um, the modern iteration of the doctrine was established by the Supreme Court in 1982 in Harlow and extended by Saucier in 2001. Um, in Saucier, the court ruled that when a defendant invokes qualified immunity, the plaintiff must prove two things. First, was there a constitutional violation? And second, was that a violation of clearly established law? And so right away, there's a heightened standard of review there. Um, and what does clearly established mean? Well, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but generally, the Supreme Court wants there to be established precedent, prior cases, that have very similar characteristics to the case in question and ruled that a fact pattern, uh, ruled that fact pattern uh, in the case a constitutional right. 
Um, and so then in Pearson in 2009, the Supreme Court continued a trend in extending uh, the qualified immunity defense uh, when it established that judges need only to prove the second part of that two-part saucier test, the violation of the clearly established law, and skip the finding that there was a violation of constitutional rights. You may be, a you may, you may be asking, you know, why does that expand the QI power? Um, well, because judges like the rest of us will often choose the past of least resistance and not have to do more work if they, you know, need to. So sometimes they skip the first part of finding a constitutional violation. And that in turn leads to less established principles, less precedent, which then in turn makes it harder to pass that second prong, that clearly established test. Okay, great. So everyone's an expert on qualified immunity now. Let me walk you through my uh, setup and methodology. Um, my research question essentially asked, are there demographic factors that correlate with judges approving defenses of qualified immunity uh, invoked specifically by law enforcement officers? Um, because that's kind of a lot of what the, what's been in the news lately um, with, with police officers being, uh, or police officers, corrections officers, sheriffs, et cetera, um, invoking this defense um, in, in civil and criminal trials. Um, sorry, just civil trials. Um, and, and I kind of developed this research question because, you know, I wanted to explore how it was actually being applied in practice um, and seeing if it was doing what it was supposed to do in an equitable manner. And I wanted to look at the present. So how is this doctrine applied in the past three years? Um, and so I searched Westlaw, uh, which is a legal database for cases that contain references to the term qualified immunity um, and also terms that related to uh, law enforcement. Um, I narrowed these to the district court level, um, which there are over 2,000 um, kind of matches. Um, and and I, I decided to look at the district court level because that's where most cases are decided. Uh, only about 25 cases, percent of cases are even reviewed on appeal. Um, and so I ended up gathering data on uh, 74, that should read N equals 74 uh, cases before my free trial ran out. Um, I also want to qualify that I haven't fully completed this project yet since my paper isn't due for like three-ish weeks. So I haven't been able to run the modeling and significance test quite yet, but this is the plan. My independent variable is whether qualif uh, qualified immunity is granted by the judge. My, sorry, that my dependent variable is whether uh, qualified immunity is granted by the judge. My independent variable is uh, the race of the plaintiff, the victim of the alleged violation by the defendant. Uh, I'll also tend to control for geography and type of case. Um, let me kind of further discuss some mitigation efforts I took to kind of avoid, um, you know, bad science. I used random sampling of the search results um, because I was not really wanting to go through 2,000 cases. Um, I plan on signing up for another free trial, though, on my other email, so my more data collection is still to come. Um, I also plan on waiting observations by case filings per district. Um, and distribution of race of uh, plaintiffs and filings to ensure I get a representative sample. Um, I'm also considering other control or instrumental variables, uh, such as the reported ideology of the judge or political leaning of the district the court is located in. Um, and so here are some of my preliminary findings. Um, of the 74 observations, qualified immunity was granted in 44 of those cases and denied in 30 cases. Uh, in race, uh, there was no clear difference in outcomes for black and white plaintiffs although there was a clear difference amongst Hispanic plaintiffs. Their cases were dismissed or lost uh, 10 times uh, in the sample period compared to only one rejection of the defense. Um, but this data kind of re further reinforces very established research that black Americans interact with the justice system much more because they're making up uh, a third of the uh, cases that are uh, being brought um, against uh, law enforcement officers while just despite being um, Twelve percent of the general population. Um, looking at the state and region, we can also kind of elucidate some more trends. Um, we see that some states often grant qualified immunity, while others uh, often reject it. I'll point you to California, uh, which rejects qualified immunity uh, eighty percent of the time, uh, compared to, like, for example, Texas that rejects it only tw uh, about a third of the time. Um, but there are relatively few observations per state. You know, there are 29 states represented, and that averages out to less than three observations per state. So I kind of group by region, um, and you can notice some differences there, uh, especially in the southeast and southwest. Uh, their denial rates are much lower than, for example, like the west. Um, or, yeah. 
Um, and so then finally, finally, I just want to highlight a subset of cases, um, those that involved fatal encounters with police. Um, and the, in those, judges are actually more liberal in granting uh, qualified immunity than average. Um, they grant qualified immunity in 70% of cases compared to 59% on average. Um, and we know that black Americans are more likely to get stopped, searched, arrested, and killed um, than white people, uh, white Americans. And so this difference might be kind of contributing to a disproportionate uh, burden on black Americans. Um, kind of further providing some context on the theory and past research on qualified immunity. Um, the justification is that eliminating qualified immunity would lead to frivolous uh, suits that kind of drain the private resources of public officials. Um, but really, recent research doesn't support that assertion uh, because in cases when qualified immunity is not granted, the government actually ends up paying 99%, 0.9% uh, of that money uh, recovered by plaintiffs, not the individual officer. So the individual officer ends up paying you know, only about 0.1% of that money. Um, and furthermore, it doesn't save the government money because it rarely leads to resolution before discovery and trial, um, which is the most costly phase of litigation since it can't be applied when there's a dispute of material facts. So if uh, the two parties dispute on, on some facts, then qualified immunity can't be granted. Um, I also wanted to note a recent Reuters investigation that looked at the differences between grants of qualified immunity pre and post Pearson, that 2009 case I mentioned, uh, which showed that there was a shift from quality, uh, qualified immunity being granted only 44% of the time pre-Pearson to 57% of the time post-Pearson. Um, and that's in line with my uh, findings where 59% uh, of the time it was granted. Sorry, this, should, this is a little backward. 59% of the time it was, it was granted. Um, and it's even worse if you just look at uh, the few SCOTUS cases that have uh, made it up in, in the past years. Um, so, Kind of looking for ways to build on this, I'd love to expand these, these methods to circuit and Supreme Court decisions, um, as well as exploring similar immunities instituted by state and uh, uh, instituted by states you know, for state constitutional violations. Um, and looking at the kind of QI landscape more, more broadly today, there, there are a variety of congressional bills um, that are agreed upon by people of wide, wildly opposing beliefs um, that kind of reform or amend Section 1983 um, and, and even, you know, Justice Clarence Thomas and, and Sonia Sotomayor, you know, very polarly opposite uh, justices kind of uh, authored a, a dissent um, in, in one of the recent cases, um, I think in 2015. Um, and, and so that being said, I would, I would still argue that the legislature is best equipped to deal with this challenge, um, given recent SCOTUS cases kind of further expanding qualified immunity. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, is there a reason why you haven't considered looking at qualified immunity on a um, county level waiver? Uh, yeah, so it's like a qualified immunity is uh, usually, like pretty much only invoked in, at federal, at the federal level. Um, and so the way the federal level works is like, the, the cases are um, brought first at the district court level, which uh, can sometimes be like a full state or like half a state or a third of a state, something like that. Um, and then appeals are filed to the circuit courts. Um, and so the district court is really where like that, that trial happens, uh, where the uh, kind of facts are argued. Um, and so that's where qualified immunity uh, would be beneficial to look at. And so that's why I kind of discuss federal. States have their own kind of uh, sometimes they have they have they have passed their own like state version of qualified immunity. Um, that's definitely I'd like to look at further, um, but federally is where I started. That's a that's a good point. I haven't thought about it that much, but uh, one thing I did notice is that. Um, a lot of the Hispanic uh, cases came from uh, like Southwest and uh, Southeastern states, um, which we saw earlier were uh, less likely to grant uh, qualified immunity, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, more likely to grant qualified immunity defenses. Um, and so that might be kind of like a, 
a reason for that. Yeah. Sweet, thanks so much. Uh, Ash, I, I, I thought, um, you know, maybe we'll see if we can find some research funding to help you have access to Westlaw on more than a trial basis. And then I looked up the individual cost to pay for Westlaw access. So the best I can offer is that you're welcome to have my free trial. That's, that's as far as, that's as, far as, we, as I can go. Um, okay, thank you. Our, our next presenter is Pranathi Rao, a first year student in the Masters of Bioethics and Science Policy. So welcome, Pranathi. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Pranathi and I'm a graduate student in Duke's master's program for bioethics and science policy. Um, one of the primary focuses of my program is technology ethics, including data privacy, digital intelligence, and cybersecurity. Um, but over the course of this semester, one of the things that really stood out to me, and especially as I was taking this class, was um, how policies, as we see in the report that's been released today, are informed by and upheld by cultural values, which made me consider how we can look at data privacy laws, which are currently in their infancy around the world, through a culturally sensitive and internationally coherent lens. Which brings us to this talk today on how we can use the Declaration of Helsinki its mistakes as well as its successes in drafting data privacy laws across the world. So what exactly is the Declaration of Helsinki in the first place? It's a landmark bioethical document that was signed into, um, that came into being in 1964 that is responsible for basically presenting international and national uh, guidelines for ethical biomedical and clinical research. It doesn't actually have any legal standing of its own, but it does provide that ethical basis for many national regulations, including Australia, Japan, Israel, Uganda, and India. Um, the FDA quotes it on its new drug applications as well. The impact, of course, is not only seen on national um, regulations, but also international ones where, um, like the World Health Organization and KIOMS, but medical journals also require authors to verify that clinical research follow Declaration of Helsinki guidelines. However, the Declaration of Helsinki is, has a few major flaws. First and foremost, it's very much oriented around Western values. It focuses, perhaps most obviously, on the rights of the individual and almost ignores cultures that prize communal decision-making. Additionally, it fails to take into consideration cross-cultural failures, most notably linguistic barriers. And when I'm talking about linguistic barriers, I'm really talking about two things here. It's a failure of communication in the first place, in the sense that you might not have an experienced translator to communicate to the other, to the patient or the subject at hand. But it's also a failure of language as well, because that the language that you are attempting to translate into might not have the current vocabulary or phrasing necessary to communicate the values necessary for the purposes of the study. Second, the Declaration of Helsinki is a very reactionary document. The World Medical Association, which is the body responsible for writing the Declaration of Helsinki, signed it into being as a result of the Nuremberg, um, Nuremberg um, tragedies that happened in the 1940s. The 2000 and 2013 revisions were guided by missteps that were taken in HIV placebo trials in the 1990s. Setting aside the actual question of the ethics of any of these mistakes, the result is that, de that the Declaration of Helsinki does not actually anticipate future missteps in clinical ethics, but reacts to previous ones. 
which brings us to the international data privacy principles that should be taken into consideration when drafting these guidelines. Please note that this is not a holistic list. Um, over the course of my literature review, this was basically what stood out the most um, to me, and these principles seem to answer those problems best. First and foremost, we need a definition, an internationally coherent definition of what private data actually is. I mean, here, how do you define reasonable or identifiable or indirect? How, in order to effectively regulate data privacy, there needs to be an understanding of what private data is in the first place. Second, we need to establish a more robust definition of informed consent for the technology sector. Right now, we give consent through accepting the terms and services contracts to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any app that we download, but data proves that less than 20% of users actually ever read them. Is that really informed consent? We also know that tech companies like Facebook have absolutely no hesitation about performing complicated psychological and behavioral experiments on its users, like when Facebook manipulated 600,000 users' feeds to, di to display either sad or happy um, posts, basically, to determine which led to more user engagement. We need more protection that runs parallel to but separate from clinical research definitions of informed consent. This protection can take many forms, but the existing format is an IRB, an Institutional Review Board. Right now, tech companies treat IRBs as an optional step. Making them a mandatory process for complicated social experiments seems like a reasonable and a necessary step forward. In fact, I take it one step further and say that all research involving human subjects requires not just an initial IRB approval, as we usually do for academic research nowadays, but a constant and independent ethics review board that can step in both during and after a research experiment and if there is research or there are results that prove that the company is harmful to its users. All of this boils down to a burden of non-maleficence, which is taken from the very first clinical ethics documents like the Belmont Report, the Nuremberg Code, and of course, the Declaration of Helsinki. It basically states that researchers have a duty of care that is um, imposed upon them not to hurt the participant, either by accident or on purpose. In fact, we can take this one step further, as Jack Falcon, a Yale Law School professor, argues, by saying that we need to place technology companies under a fiduciary duty. A fiduciary is essentially defined as someone who collects personal information, has greater ability to monitor our activities than we can monitor them, and performs a virtually indispensable social service. They have a legal obligation, essentially, to put their clients' needs first. We already know that technology companies aggregate immense amounts of data on us, to the point that they can predict whether parents are expecting a child or how somebody will vote. Ensuring that there's a legal basis for users to claim harm seems like a good first step towards ensuring privacy. From all of this, we can understand that data privacy is not the same as clinical ethics. It cannot and should not be expected to play by the same rules. One of the biggest differences between tech ethics and clinical ethics is essentially the rapid pace at which technology is outpacing the policy that's governing it. Right now, experts estimate that there's already a 20 to 25 year gap between the governing policy and the technology that's currently being produced. As technology advances at market limited rates and regulation continues at Congress limited rates, the, um, that gap will only grow, which is why we need forward looking and progressive regulations, namely adaptive regulations that are not just one time policies, but rather regulations that exist in a feedback loop from the market the industry, and the users. Data privacy is an under-legislated sector of society, and an international set of guidelines can provide immense help to countries around the world. Over the course of my talk, we've discussed a few of the principles to be taken into consideration, and the effect that it can have on the market, the industry, policymakers, as well as users. Thank you.
I didn't. Uh, ask you a question. Oh. Although I have several questions, but uh, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about like what are the specific privacy harms that are caused by uh, like non-reviewed studies conducted by tech companies? Uh, because I feel like a lot of the kind of uh, way of kind of proving that. Uh, or kind of regulating those types of behaviors are when like actual concrete harms are caused. Um, and so that's why kind of often privacy gets like a bad rap, like for not being able to kind of do more stringent regulations because people struggle to point to like one concrete you know, harm. So what would you kind of say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely examples of being taken into consideration, right? Um, for example, Target essentially has an algorithm that is built to identify um, parents that are expecting a child in the very first semester, in the very first trimester, excuse me. Um, and so they send ads to that person's house in order to reveal that, um, in order to basically kind of incentivize them to buy their products from Target, right, before other markets can do the same. But while this might seem like a harmless prospect on the surface, what if you have an individual who doesn't, um, who is in an abusive relationship, right? Who, who's in a situation where they don't want it communicated that they are pregnant. All of these, like the Facebook emotional manipulation study that I mentioned, obviously there was a, a period of time for about a week in January of 2014, where certain users only saw sad or negative emotional posts, that has an impact on the mental health of that individual. And I mean, I think the issue is that it's not something as easily quantifiable as perhaps, you know, a communicable illness or um, money, like from a fiscal uh, point of view, but it is something that needs to be taken into consideration. And that's obviously the challenges with, reg um, with regulating it, but, there are real harms that need to be taken into consideration here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Not really questions. <laughs> yeah. um, so, individual doctors take the Hippocratic Oath. Mm -hmm. Do hospitals take the Hippocratic Oath? No. Okay. So, I'm curious. Uh, that wasn't a sarcastic question. I genuinely don't know whether like hospital systems make some kind of institutional commitment. Uh, one of my questions is whether you think that the best avenue here is to create a, a set of standards for tech companies as institutions or a set of standards for employees of tech companies as individuals in the same way that it's actually doctors that are supposed to swear to the Hippocratic Oath. And whether you, obviously this whole thing is done uh, as an address to institutions, but I'm curious whether you think that was, was that a strategic choice to go to institutions over individuals, or do you think there is um, sort of benefits or detriments to doing one of these? Well, I think my answer to that is that doctors aren't the only ones that perform biomedical research. So, like, if you're a scientific researcher, you can perform research on human subjects and never take the Hippocratic Oath. So it's an so the Declaration of Helsinki is not just for doctors, but it's you know applicable to basically clinical research across the board. So it's an institutional um, document from the way that I interpret it. Sure, y yes, yes, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna stop there. We, All right. Uh, we'll, we'll talk at the reception, that's the whole point. Oh, okay.
Okay, thank you, Pranathi. Uh, we have our, we're, we are up to our final presentation. Uh, we are going to hear from three students. Please, make your way. Now's the time. Uh, Lori Babb is a second year student in the Masters of Global Health program. Uh, Elaine Yi is a Trinity senior studying public policy, computer science, and history. And Andrew Lee is a Trinity senior studying economics and computer science. Welcome. Okay, so hi everyone. As Dr. Hallowell just said, he introduced all of us, but you can also probably see that all three of us are Asian Americans. So we're all student researchers and we were in this course, we were thinking about what kind of racial inequality research we wanted to work on. And obviously this is one that really struck close to home for all three of us. So the presentation we put today, together today for you is entitled, The Landscape of Anti-Asian Aggression During COVID-19. So, um, my fellow student, Sarah O'Malley, talked about this as well, that within the Tulsa Race Massacre event, you might be wondering how this overlaps, but it's actually quite clear. So if you think back to the Tulsa Race Massacre, they were also in an environment that was not only perpetuating, but honestly encouraging white supremacy through this intensely racist rhetoric and these really excluding policies that allowed for such an act of terror and violence to happen. And we're living in something quite similar to that today. So within the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021, we have experienced this history of anti-Asian aggression that has enabled and perpetuated and quite frankly, again, encouraged this anti-Asian aggression that has led us to wanna tell you more about it today. So we've seen these prior acts of history and aggression within the anti-Asian space. But what's most interesting is that COVID-19 almost stood as a vacuum or an amplifier for this violence. And we want to tell you more about that. And we're going to start with some background from Eileen. Okay, so first, um, it's important to know that, as Lori mentioned, anti-Asian violence is not new. Um, the earliest immigrants in the 19th and earliest early 20th century faced a cycle of economic exploitation and then violent and restrictive backlash. Um, and this often took the form of um, lynchings as well as riots and property that was burned down. Um, a lot of this stemmed from early beliefs and stereotypes that like Asians were the yellow peril, um, which reflects the fear of domination and that Asian immigrants would kind of swallow or overpower Western values such as democracy. Um, and this also painted them as foreigners that would never assimilate or didn't belong. Um, so one interesting thing to know is that in 1853, the California Supreme Court set precedent that Asian, an Asian person couldn't testify against a white person in a criminal proceeding. Um, and this kind of led to a wide understanding that there would be no legal repercussions for violence and Asians were kind of seen to be open um, to attack. So effectively in the past, there are many cases where violence has been used to really drive people out of the community and keep them out of the community. Um, and we can see how some of these stereotypes have evolved over time as well. Um, the second thing is that there's also been a history of violence and um, othering during pandemics or contagious disease outbreaks. Um, disease has always been linked to, um, or commonly linked to outsiders. Um, a lot of stereotypes or like tropes are constructed and then used as justification to um, kind of blame another group that is not the majority group for um, the things that are happening in society. Um, one example is during the bubonic plague in 1900. Um, it was framed as a racial disease where only Asian bodies could be infective, infected. So this is kind of an example of a belief that the intrinsic biological quality of a particular group makes them more prone to getting a certain disease, um, as well as infecting others. Um, secondly, it was Chinatown at that time during the plague, um, as well as other times, such as during the smallpox outbreak, was viewed as a laboratory of infection. And this also stems from a belief that outsiders behave badly, differently, or in um, unclean ways, such as um, their living conditions or their diet and food. 
Um, so kind of all of this stems from the belief in like an inher inherent inferiority and the inability um, of Asians to assimilate to American culture. I'll let Andrew talk more. Yeah, so um, we want to bring up one story in our recent history of anti-Asian hate um, that has been uh, one of, I guess, the most um, compelling or rememberable or maybe even forgotten stories. Um, and so uh, we want to pose a question, what's the first thing that you think of when you hear of Vincent Chen? Um, and think about that as we watch a short clip here. Okay, we'll see if this works. Okay, if not, that is fine. Um, but the is Jubilee. Is there a way to click the? It's embedded in the slide deck. I think we just need to be able to click it. I'm not sure how this technology works in front of us. Yes. Okay, it it should be embedded. Oh, well, it's a PowerPoint. I'm not sure. Oops. Okay, that's fine. It might link to. YouTube, um, if you could play from I think it's unfortunate that a lot of Asian Americans don't know who um, just up to 32 seconds, Louise. Uh, until 32, or you can play from the beginning until 32. Just no, the, no, 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 just you, the first 30 seconds. Yeah, the first 32 Vincent seconds. Vincent Chen is. What's the first thing that you think of when you hear of Vincent Chen? Painful. Tragic. Oh, hate crimes. Injustice. Sorry, who is that? Who? Uh, I actually have never heard of Vincent Chan. Forgotten? It was the day before his wedding, and he was... Yeah, and so as you can see in those videos, in this video, um, I'm also one of those Asian Americans who did not know who Vincent Chen was until I began this research project. Um, for those of you who also do not know who Vincent Chen is, uh, he was a Chinese-American man um, who went to his bachelor's party in Detroit in 1987 um, where he was confronted by two men who were white um, who, uh, who uh, committed an act of hate crime against him, um, citing uh, hate for losing their jobs um, because of the Japanese auto industry. Um, he was beaten. Uh, with a baseball bat and eventually killed. And his family later went to his funeral instead of his wedding. And um, the two men were charged for second degree uh, murder, which was then reduced to manslaughter. And then a three year probation with um, just under a $4,000 fine for each. Um, after learning about this history, um, I just thought back to what we have seen similarly in Tulsa, these histories of injustices and violence against minorities are so often forgotten because they are neglected to be told. And so um, we want to remind you uh, and or share for the first time these histories as we consider AAPI experiences um, now during COVID-19. Right, so um, we've alluded to how this anti-Asian hate is not new, but we wanna specifically talk about it within the construct of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it served as this like vacuum and amplifier. So we've talked a little bit about rhetoric, so that's a word often used in academia, but it basically means the kind of language you use. And it also communicates how communication itself can be a tool for good or bad. And oftentimes within the anti-Asian aggression movement, it's used as a tool to suppress or to swallow and to basically cover up the AAPI experience. So we wanna kind of take it within the constraint of the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, um, no one has to tell you that COVID-19 is a global pandemic, we all live in it, but we just wanna do a quick, quick refresh. You can see, all of the continents in this world and just thinking about how COVID-19 has been able to travel differently as a pandemic than past pandemics because within the modern space of 2021, 
in the past few years, we experienced intense globalization that allows for a really internationally collaborative world. I mean, I think in a different time we would have panelists and others from different continents and that's really amazing, but it also comes with a lot of spread and um, clearly pandemics love that. So I also wanna zoom in a little bit more into COVID-19 within North Carolina, considering that's where we all live, work and study. So thinking back, I remember when the first COVID-19 case landed in the United States, it was in January, it was in Seattle, Washington, which is actually where one of our students is from, so the West Coast. And I remember being in North Carolina and not feeling alarmed. Um, our first cases in North Carolina were in March, which is what this WRL news article talks about. So there was a conference up north in, at Harvard and five test results came back positive um, after flight from Logan to RDU. And personal experience, I was on that flight. Didn't have COVID, but very close. So thinking about how COVID has traveled through our spaces and into our worlds. So we've just talked about how COVID is spread and we want to talk to you about the other element, which is hate crimes. So to look at the landscape of hate crimes, we considered three different categories of data sources. The first being government, the second nonprofits, and the third media. Um, and so we just want to provide a quick overview of each of these three data sources and then go a little deeper into two of them. So the first is government. So the FBI um, under the Department of Justice uh, has been running the Unifo Uniform Crime Reporting Program um, since the 1900s, and they have been collecting hate crime data specifically since 1991. Um, this program data shows that anti-Asian and anti-Pacific Islander hate crimes peaked at the onset of COVID-19. Um, we also see uh, Stop AAPI Hate um, that began very recently, um, and they report 9,081 incidences from March 2020 to June 2021, where 63.7% is considered verbal harassment. Thirdly, under media sources, um, the Virulent Hate Project at the University of Michigan perused over 4,000 uh, news and media articles and identified 1,023 unique instances of racism. Um, and the New York Times cited more than 110 uh, media reported hate incidences with clear racist backing. Um, so let's take a look at specifically the FBI data um, before we look at a story from Stop AAPI Hate. So this is the trend um, of uh, the number of hate crimes motivated by anti-Asian and anti-Pacific Islander hate from 1991, the beginning of hate crime reporting by the UCR, to 2020, uh, this past year. So as you see, in 2020, we saw the greatest number of reported anti-Asian and anti-Pacific Islander hate crimes in over 20 years since 1997. And there were a total of 325 hate crimes reported last year. Since 1997, um, we have seen a downward trend in the number of hate crimes until 2016, so for about the past 20 years. Um, and although we saw this trend reverse with a yearly increase in reported hate crimes from 2016 to 2019, um, that uptick is nowhere near the uptick we saw in the past year. Um, it's greater than those years combined. So from 2016 to 2019, we saw an uptick from 114 to 188 reports, um, and that increased from 188 to 325 in this past year. So this is convincing evidence that hate crimes increased with COVID-19, um, but what evidence would further demonstrate that this uptick is a result of the pandemic? So let's take a look at the month-to-month -month data in 2020. So um, as you see here, during 2020, about one third of the instances were reported in the months of March and April, right after the onset of the pandemic in the United States. In those two months combined, we saw 102 of the 325 total instances in 2020. Compare, compare this to the only 28 instances we see reported in January and February. So our data analysis shows that there is a visible link between COVID-19 and anti-Asian and anti-Pacific Islander hate crimes. Now, I want to share a story um, from Stop API Hate's national report released in um, August of 2021 that covers instances up to June 2021. Um, on the other side of this quantitative approach at hate crimes, we see qualitative stories behind these hate crimes. Um, and this is one from Villa Park, California. It says, my mom went to a grocery store in Villa Park, California for the first time in a while. While shopping, she passed by a white older couple, a man and a woman, 
and as she passed them, the husband explained, disgusting Japanese stuff. My mom was shaking and on the verge of tears. Stop AAPI Hate shares these stories behind these hate crimes um, because there is a person on the receiving end of every racial aggression. Um, the New York Times further makes these stories come alive through videos um, of police footage or uh, uh, surveillance cameras um, depicting victims being pepper sprayed um, and even pushed down and stomped on the head. This is the landscape of hate crimes that we are seeing against the AAPI community during COVID-19. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, our research so far has really focused on overlap, exploring the overlaps of pandemic violence as well as racial violence. Um, we have really attempted to answer the question of what do we know about hate crimes as well as hate incidents and anti-Asian rhetoric during COVID-19 and what can we do with what we know. Um, so first is that we can already kind of see a need for the disaggregation of data. Um, the both data sources, actually the government federal data source that um, Andrew talked about um, does not report anything further than anti-Asian bias. Um, so it's important to note that the broadness of using just a racial categorization of Asian can really obscure and overlook the diversity of experiences within that group. Um, and as well as um, our research will also attempt to explore kind of um, the intersectionality, not just between like race uh, and gender as well as class. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we definitely would like to look more into that, but from like what I've seen, there has definitely been an uptick in um, hate crimes against the African American community as well. Um, and that's probably uh, related to the Black Lives Matter movement that has been on the rise um, after the recent, uh, the Ford killing and other instances. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, we are not that sure. Uh, I am interested in looking more into that, um, and that is something that we will dig deeper um, as we finalize the research project. Yeah. Um, do you know if the um, increase in police crimes were more perpetrated towards like essential workers or people who, like I'm thinking about the stay-at-home mandate, Um, so I actually think it's been a mix because um, COVID has also been operating for about 18 months in the state. So in the beginning, we did have those stay at home orders, but there also were like were a central task. And it's been a very disproportionate amount of violence towards like elderly and also women. So it's not necessarily just um, an AAPI person working. It can also be like an AAPI person just like experiencing life who is like burdened by this aggression. <coughs> So at this time, I'll uh, welcome up Professor Darity to provide us with a few closing remarks for the day. And I'll just say before he comes up, thanks to all the students for presenting. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the reception and make sure to get your copy of the Tulsa book at the registration table afterward. So I, I don't want to give you uh, from the, uh, the food and, and drink too long. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Professor Hollowell for his leadership of the seminar. Uh, and I want to thank all of you as students for the excellent work that you've done in this semester. Uh, 
the Global Inequality Research Seminar is becoming a big hit at Duke, apparently. And I think it's because of you all. So thank you very, very much. And uh, please, uh, let me also say thank you to, uh, to Gwen Wright, uh, our Administrative Director at the Cook Center, and Joanne uh, O'Neill, our Grants Manager, because they are the individuals who always organize uh, these these superb events, and you'll see how superb in a moment. Okay, so so uh, please eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs>